Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan, the voice behind that Kaito Dan, and welcome to my review for Ruby Volume 4 Chapter 3 of Runaways and Stowaways. First off, sorry about the mess with my reaction video for the last episode. Got some unfortunate blocking issues there that made things a little bit rough getting that out. And sadly, the best that I could do right now is make an edited upload with the source video being pixelized. I hope such an edit won't be needed again, but for the time being, that's how that specific reaction will be like. Sorry again for that mess. And finally, same as ever, do not watch this video if you haven't seen the episode in question. Anyway, let's get back on track. And after a real emotional episode last time out, we're diving into events with the last two of the former Team Ruby. But was our first look at the Faunus and Firecracker this volume worth the wait, or was it all washed up? Let's get into this. So to begin with, I'm actually going to start with everything going on in Patch, where we see Yang is still far from the vibrant and active girl that we've known for so long. This scene does let us see more of the quaint and honestly quite homely place that she lives in with Tai, Ruby and Zwei, who we also see in the shot taking a nap. I'd honestly live in a place like this, it's quite nice. It's here we also see some updates on things thanks to the news. Vale is still a nightmare to access right now beyond evacuations, efforts are being made to fix the CCT, but it's rather unlikely to come back anytime soon, and thanks to a more animated than usual Lisa Lavender, it's public knowledge now how Adam was a major offender during the Grim attack, painting a big target on the masked White Fang member. As Yang turns off the TV though with disgust when Adam's mentioned, her old man Ty drops in with a present to share with his eldest daughter. Earlier than I expected, it turns out to be the freshly shipped, Atlas crafted, state of the arts new full metal arm for Yang. And yes, I did make the obvious reference. This is actually from Ironwood's consideration, and Ty's happy he didn't need to pull some strings for such a thing. But yeah, the general seems extremely grateful for Yang's efforts back in Vale, and this is her reward. A reward that Yang isn't exactly all hot on, it seems. Not looking ready to take that next step right now. Though Tai is understanding in the end, and does see that maybe now's not the time. Credit to Yang though, she is still trying to adapt with using one arm, and do her part around the home. Managing okay with the chores, until her dropped glass snaps back some painful memories of Adam. Yang almost losing herself before finding her feet again, with Tai watching on with concern. This is all a quick glance at Yang's current lifestyle, more so just to see how she's coping rather than pushing her into a new arc just yet, and it's understandable. We did need to see if she's coping alright, and while I am again surprised that we got this prosthetic on the table already, I am quite intrigued by seeing a Yang coping with more mental scarring than anything physical. She's faced enough issues already that she could just punch through, now it's time to see how she can confront something that she can't deck the snot out of. One person who could perhaps aid her in the future with these challenges, is also someone who made things a little bit painful in the past. That of course being her partner, Blake Belladonna, crossing the seas in this next shot on the way to her next destination. Wait, big body of water? The episode's initials make up auras? Pokemon auras? 7.8 too much wa- Anyway, so yeah, when we last saw Blake, she had run away after the clash with Adam and bolted out of Vale. Now she's faring the ocean, and is looking a bit paranoid. Calm down Blake, it's not Adam or the White Fang behind you, it's only the captain of the Titanic, or Captain Birdseye from the food products. Take your pick, I don't know. Oh, and he's voiced by Bruce Carey, who many of you might know as the dub voice for Silver's Raleigh from One Piece. Anyway, Captain Whitebeard here tries to ease the nerves of Miss Belladonna, but it's clear that she'd rather be alone right now. She may want to be alone, but I think we all know that she does miss those she left behind. Still, the current goal, whatever it may be, is too important right now, and it's time to steal herself, complete with making a big statement by not only removing her bow, but tossing it into the sea, leaving her faunus ears free for everyone to see. Wherever she's going, we don't need bows. 
We may need a bigger boat though for what is lurking in the sea, or whoever is clad in that brown cloak. Gee, I wonder who it could be. Fast forward to some lovely sunset lit waves, and Blake finally does catch wind of her stalker, but he bolts before the other hidden figure pops up. At last folks, we got ourselves a sea based grim, a nasty looking sea dragon. It's all hands on deck as the ship crew and Blake try to slay the beast, but it's a hassle with the limited solid ground for Blake to use and the ship needing time and a good shot with its cannons. At least we know the ships don't need to depend on just the Huntsman for some offense when it's necessary. The Sea Dragon makes things even more harder when it spread its wings like its big brother, and makes it quite hard to pin down, even for the giant cannon of the ship and Blake with her clones. Step right up then, Mr. Cloak, or more accurately, Mr. Sun Wukong. Cause you know, if there's gonna be a ship, he's gonna stow away on it. The monkey lad finally gets to do some solid work at last with his Via Sun clone semblance, the many glowing copies doing their best to control the lightning blasting powered terror, but still it's not going down easily, and Sun, Blake, and the crew have to go in for the kill. Sun and Blake ground the dragon and avoid getting chomped, sparked, or both, and with a well placed ram and blast from the ship, it's toast. Happy days! High fives for all! Except for you, son. You get a slap. So that's our first foray into a sea grim battle, and for what it's worth, I dug it. This was always going to be a hard battle to plan out for the crew bee, since they would have had to work with the heroes not really being able to have the plane field on their side. A lot of the action would have to be mostly air combat, and with the Grim being sleek and nimble in the air already, it kind of made it a bit more of a challenge. I wasn't expecting anything too wild, and it didn't stop the fight from feeling tense, high paced, and it did have some goofy moments as well thanks to Sun. Plus, it was a nice touch to not only see how the two clone users work off each other, some way smoother than others, but again also seeing the ship get involved too. It helps that we can actually see that even if you're not a huntsman, you do have some elements that can help you out. Anyway, night comes and it's time for a little Faunus chit chat, and Blake is pissed, notably fair given Sun has followed her. Sun does explain why in his own aloof way. He saw Blake running away back in Bell and has followed her to help her out, in what he assumes is a one person charge against the White Fang. Gotta love Blake's expression here by the way, but Sun is actually wrong. Turns out Blake is actually just going home to think things through after a really strenuous time back at Beacon. She's got a lot on her mind, and familiar ground could help her out. That place being Menagerie. Yes folks, Blake does indeed come from the well known Faunus based land, finally answering that question. Makes sense then why she ditched the bow, no need for that when it's such a Faunus hotspot. It's not enough to turn away Sun though, who by the way also noted that his teammates Neptune, Sage and Scarlet are heading to Mistral, so that's cool, Team Ranger may get some much needed backup from the local trio of Team Sun. Anyway, their leader is sticking by Blake for now, for better or worse. Even if Blake won't face the White Fang herself, nothing is stopping the group coming for her, especially Adam so a friendly and helpful face could do some good. We'll see soon enough. But that's not all guys, cause it's time to check up on things over in Salem's domain, and it's quite disturbing and intriguing at the same time. Seems Salem is trying to coach Cinder in regards to something, likely her newly gained full maiden powers, but the Wicked Witch only notes her student has to make it fear her. Whatever this it is, it's something Cinder must control if Salem's schemes are to go without any complications, and if Cinder can't control whatever she's trying to master, you can only imagine it won't bode well for our heroes. Still, we can't end with just that to stew on, how about a freaky looking mix of a grim, a jellyfish and a crystal ball? Gliding past the spook pair of emerald and mercury is a seer grim and it seems to say something to Salem that makes her question Cinder's word, 
on whether or not she did indeed kill Ozpin. And it's clear that she's not happy with her ally, even demanding Cinder to tell her directly, not through Emerald. The wounded woman only able to sputter out a simple yes as a response. So if it wasn't already suspicious enough the current fate of Ozpin, now it's even more curious a topic. And Salem seems this discussion means efforts in Beacon need to step up. Not for Ozpin, mind you, but for a relic that they can't seem to find just yet. It looks like Beacon still has some worth. But what is Salem planning? What is this relic and why does she want it? Is it Ozpin's cane? And what did happen to Ozpin? And if he's alive, what is he planning? All these questions and more we'll have to wait for another time though, because that's it for this episode. Let's share some final thoughts. I think a good way to describe this particular episode is it's another foundation building one, mostly in regards to Blake and Yang. One part letting us see a glimpse of what is in the Ark in store for Blake, with going back home, exploring this long awaited area remnant, and seeing how Blake copes with all the hurt and confusion she's carrying in the process. Well, Yang, it was shorter than I admittedly expected for our first time with her this volume, and yet it was still solid in showing that she is still crippled emotionally right now, more so than physically. Her buzz is gone, she's stuck at home without any action, and she's still not finding herself ready to take that next step in her recovery, and the sighting of the past wounding her deeply still confirms that aspect is there, with surely more to witness in Patch on the way. Again, it was short, and it did come with an early look at her future with the prosthetic, but on that note, I actually kind of admit that it is a better call to show off that arm now, but not have Yang take it up. Let's face it, ever since she first lost her arm, fans have been speculating that Yang would get a replacement. So having the first scene in the volume with Yang, having her receive it, works, because right there, it is prime and ready for her, but she's not ready for it. She knows that she's gonna need to find her spark again if she's ever gonna even consider picking that arm up, and it's gonna serve as the figure point for Yang to perhaps push herself forward just a little bit more than she may be ready right now, and I fully suspect with those two guys that we saw in the opening around Yang's portion, those two may challenge Yang themselves, and that would force Yang's hand into gearing back up into fighting, should they come for her. It's one thing to say, keep moving forward, but it's another to feel ready to do so. And it's that tone of the scene, where you can see a future for Yang, and yet we still need to see her build up to it, that makes up for the surprise of the arm being revealed so quickly. By the way, I like that Tai was trying his best to help Yang, and you could tell he does mean well with sharing the arm and praising his daughter, but he's not quite got the right answers. He didn't exactly get the best out of Yang's current state of mind when first showing off the arm, and it's quite clear that she's not back on her feet, and yet he does see that he can't really help right now. He doesn't know what to do, and he honestly knows it's something that perhaps Yang needs more time on, and perhaps might be something that she needs to confront with herself. It's pleasing to see for a guy who we've known in the past has had to deal with a lot already, both as a father figure and as a person himself. With my feelings on the battle, as I've said before, I liked how the Kruby managed to showcase a Grim that dominated in its natural habitat, that did handicap the heroes, who are mostly better off with close quarters combat, a style that they couldn't really display with such limited ground to their favour. And in the end, we got some lovely directive work out of it too, not to mention some chuckles and even a rare win for a non-huntsman element. And I like the fact that the fight was still free-flowing while feeling tense. Blake leaving her bow is going to be a simple yet effective kicker for this next development in her story, especially since it was such a notable aspect to not only her look, but her nature overall as a faunus trying to find equality. Now she's not really so much focused on that goal, rather she just needs time to find herself again, to rebuild her confidence, thus the trip back home for some self-reflection. Sunbeam with Blake also feels like a fitting choice, 
as much as they sometimes bicker and banter, and their differing levels of energy and train of thought doesn't exactly go smoothly, they do have some entertaining chemistry. Sun the untamed but good-natured free spirit will be a nice aspect to see more of against Blake's more grounded and emotionally on edge mindset currently. Sun's inclusion will also help us see Menagerie through fresh eyes alongside us viewers, and as a constant reminder to Blake that she has left people behind, she's left friends behind, and once she feels she's ready again, Sun will be around to help her remember that she's not alone, even if her rash actions may mean that any reunion won't go without some bumps. Gotta give some more thumbs up to the animation team by the way guys, you can really tell the benefits from these guys switching over to Maya, with the higher quality and smoother animations, and stronger directive angles put into play. Plus a fun first look at Sea Base Grimm, and some more outstanding and very vibrant expressions, especially from Blake. And here's a sentence I never thought I would say. I love how well animated Blake's ears were. Seriously, they truly feel alive and active now. Fan Fantastic stuff. Lastly, the bits with Salem and Cinder is a bit confusing in terms of finding out that there's a new mystery element with these relics, but it was still intriguing, especially in seeing Cinder trying to control what it is inside of her. And it at least showed that not all the cards are in Salem's hands, and that they are having their own hurdles to cross over. Time to close up now with the voice acting praise of the episode. And I'm going to pass this on to Aaron as Blake. Everyone else was on point for the episode, but I was still quite pleased with Aaron's continued exploration of some more emotions for the usually so compact cat girl. Nice work. So overall, it was a definitely enjoyable episode. It harkened me to some of the first episode's elements, where it was more about exploration in terms of actually showing what could be seen in the future rather than anything currently. And while that could be a bit of a step backwards after the interesting and very exciting episode last week, I still feel it was followed up wisely enough with some interesting glimpses of the future on the horizon, to where I can still say I was satisfied. But those are my thoughts, tell me yours in the comments down below. Was it good? Was it bad? Be sure to share, and while you're at it, like and favorite the video if you wish, subscribe and click on the bell to know when new uploads are out, and follow me on Twitter at ThatKaitoDan for anything from yours truly including Ruby related posts, updates on future content and more. Until next time though, have a good day or good night, and peace out.